can't see anyone. Okay, there we are. Do you, so do you want me to start? Introduce yes, Melon? Start the introductions. Yeah. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we're really, really happy to have Merlin tonight. Um, Merlin Thomas is at Monash Uni. He's the, he's the main author of the book, Fast Living, Slow Aging. And um, he's also a renowned international expert on diabetes and anti-aging. And he's written a number of books. And the last one was on longevity foods. So um, he's going to talk about intermittent fasting. And, yeah, because the devil's in the detail with this. And it's quite challenging to do, we've found, um, up front. And um, Margot was saying how she found one of the hardest things was around glucose or, you know, sugar control. And so Merlin's able to sort of talk about the mechanics of um, how it works. Anyway, go Merlin. Cool. Well, thanks, Kate. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming out this evening. It's a real pleasure to be talking about uh, um, all of this. Sorry about my desktop doing weird things, but maybe that's because I'm sticking things on it. Let me just hang on a second. Goodbye, Cortana. There we go. All right. So this is going to be really an introductory session into the science of, of intermittent fasting. Um, as you've heard already, my name is Professor Merlin Thomas. I work at Monash University here in Melbourne, Australia. And in about over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the science behind intermittent fasting and why some people believe that it can provide an opportunity not only for weight loss, but also for better health and even possibly longevity. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more uh, out there that uh, you'll be able to read. And I'll send some articles through, as I did today to Kate, as things come through. And I'll only be a broad brushstrokes telling you a little bit about what's going on. But hopefully, I can provide enough science for you to be able to take these ideas, go and do some exploring on yourself, and then come back with some further questions um, a little bit late, later on. Okay. So let's get started a little bit about the idea behind intermittent fasting. Most of the issues regarding intermittent fasting are based upon this, which is gaining weight and making sure that you don't gain weight are perhaps the biggest challenge for people as they get older. Everybody has it a challenger. In fact, it's probably the most important health challenge of our life will be probably our waistline. And how we rise to that challenge or not rise will be the biggest determinant of whether we live well, um, live healthy and live a long life. And obviously gaining too much fat is really important in terms of um, reducing our life and becoming obese. In fact, the impact of, uh, of excessive weight is probably in just as important as, for example, being a smoker or, or other kinds of things in terms of our life. The big issue that... Um, that about fat is really not what fat is, but what it's doing for us. And in order to understand that, you need to understand a little bit about what fat's doing. So if you imagine, if you like, your fat is your pantry in your house. Now, if you are like me who haven't had dinner and you come home, you're hungry, you can go to your pantry and grab from your pantry something to eat and use up your pantry. And people who are relatively thin using their pantry quite often you see that there's not much on their shelves and so they're always able to bring in the shopping use their shopping up and there's always a bit of room for putting on more just in case you get invited out to a party and you bring some extra food behind unfortunately most people are sitting in this middle category where their pantries are getting relatively full so every day if you like you bring home energy food but every time you eat out or you don't do the exercise that you should, you're not actually burning up those calories. So your pantry remains relatively full. Unfortunately, at some point, your pantry becomes so full that there is not enough room left in the pantry. And you start putting um, your leftovers instead of into the pantry into abnormal places like you stick the shopping in the bathroom or or you stick it in the in the, in the laundry and of course your bathroom and your laundry don't function like they should do anymore and actually most of the diseases that are associated with excessive fat and lifestyle are really due to just like that that situation there's fat in the wrong places interfering with the normal functions of those things and this is why it's called ectopic fat because ectopos in Greek means out of place. So if you have fat out of place in the liver, it doesn't respond so well to the normal signals that it should respond to. 
and that leads to the risks of diabetes. The same in your pancreas. If you have fat in the wrong place around your heart and around the arteries, that leads to heart disease. And if you have too much fat in other places, certainly in around the intestines, it can also contribute to cancers. So fat in the wrong place is the issue. So what we have to do essentially is to find ways to make our pantry empty out a little bit. And that's where diet and exercise come in. And most of the work that has been done on intermittent fasting has been around changing the balance. So if you imagine that, for example, there are many different ways to, to lower your weight. Weight, if you like, is a balance between the amount of energy coming in, in other words, your food, and the amount of energy coming out in terms of the amount that you exercise and your metabolism. If they're stable in terms of their balance, then what happens is your weight's stable. But if you eat more in terms of calories or are less physically active, that tips and you gain weight. Equally, if you want to lose weight, and everyone knows this, you need to change that balance in the opposite direction. You need to have more burning activity, either be more physically active, or you need to eat less in terms of calories. So most people in their average daily life would eat probably in Australia, well over 2000 calories, but they only need around about 14, 1500 for their metabolism. So there's that little gap. It's a little gap. It's only the equivalent of, let's say, um, two, sp two uh, spoonfuls of food or, or walking an extra 500 meters every single day. But every day that it adds up, a little bit more gets in the pantry and a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more until there's no room left and then it spills over. The big issue is that some people um, of certain ethnic backgrounds, for particularly Asian, um, Indian, and Middle Eastern um, individuals, are born with a small pantry. So they fill up very fast, and so that a relatively low BMI, a very relatively low waist, they start finding themselves developing complications of excess fat. So, for example, the risk of diabetes in a Filipino woman with a BMI of 25 is actually the same as the risk of diabetes in a, a woman, for example, in the United States with a BMI of 33. Small pantry means earlier spillover, and essentially, um, that's the risk. So intermittent fasting is a way to reduce the amount of energy that you take in. Same way that you could do that by saying, well, I'll just reduce the amount of energy that I like by going a low carb diet or, or, or low calorie diet or reducing less overall. And what's really interesting is that when you look at intermittent fasting um, overall, it's fixed over six months on your weight, on your BMI, on your waist circumference, on your hip circumference, actually there's no difference. So intermittent fasting can lower your weight, but it's no better than taking less calories for other means. In other words, from a weight point of view, it's only calories that count. That balance is the only important thing. And so that's why everyone's saying go, go, go intermittent fasting because it's a means for weight loss. Except for us, we're not saying that. What we are saying is that it can offer an opportunity for weight loss, but it does much, much more than this. And so that's the real exciting thing about um, this particular um, uh, diet. So when you talk about intermittent fasting, you need to understand what most people do is not intermittent fasting. Most people live in what's called the bonanza state. In other words, we're having a good time, we're not exercising too much, and there's plenty of calories coming in from the time we get up until the time we go uh, uh, asleep, or sometimes even later when we're drinking all of that red wine and, and all of those calories are adding up. So we're spending very little time fasting. If our body is not fasting at all, it is what's called tolerably inefficient. In other words, your body goes, you know, damage, what damage? I don't need to worry about that. I've got plenty of energy coming in. I can deal with a little bit of inefficiency. I don't have to worry about this because I'm living in a, you know, a, a pastor world, a fantastic world. I'm having a good time. And this is particularly useful when you're making the most, for example, of a, a food source in many millions of years ago for, for us in the past. But unfortunately now we are, if you like, pers oops, persistently postprandial. Oops, I lost my table there. There we go. Let's go back again. So we're always persistently postprandial. In other words, we spend most of our lives immediately after eating. And so our body is always in the phase of laying down fat 
always on the phase of tolerating inefficiencies because there's so much food to go around, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. And unfortunately, this is the reason that um, we run and are so unhealthy as we get older because we've been living in this persistent postprandial state. The alternative is the fasting state. And the fasting state is, if you like, what's called necessarily efficient. You can't be, if you're not eating at all, you can't allow, for example, yourself to have inefficiencies in terms of your metabolism. You can't have inefficiencies in terms of your utilization of energy sources. You can't have inefficiencies in terms of damage because if you have a damaged system and you've got no food, of course, what are you going to do in the desert? You're going to run out of energy and you're going to die. So the fasting state switches everything to efficiency. And the efficiency is what really garners the effects of um, intermittent fasting and makes you stronger and healthier. Because by fasting, your body is believing that where is your next calorie going to come from? So I can't allow, for example, my mitochondria to be you know, a little bit inefficient, burn energy inefficiency, throw off radicals, because I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. I can't allow my metabolism to waste excess energy. It has to be lean, mean fighting machine. And so all of those um, improvements in terms of hormones, in terms of mitochondria, in terms of all of those things that you've read in the literature, you go, wow, this is cool, fasting affects autophagy, or wow, this affects insulin resistance, or wow, this affects, they're all related to being lean and mean, which is really what the body's trying to trick you to do. Okay, so there are very different many ways to achieve intermittent fasting. There is alternate day fasting, which was the original one, or every alternate day where you, you essentially have nothing but liquids. There's the famous 5-2 diet where you're on 5-2. For those two days, you're taking very small amount of energy, um, about 20 to 25% of the energy that you'd have, about a quarter of or to a fifth of those amount of energy on the fasting days. There's the now famous fasting mimicking diet, which is involved in um, taking monthly cycles of taking this really five-day uh, fast in which you're taking less than half the amount of food that you would normally. And then there is the interesting one that, that a lot of us are involved in, which is time-restricted feeding, which means that you're only eating for a certain period of time, but for the majority of your day, not just while you're asleep, but majority of your day, you are now not eating um, a significant amount. The goal of intermittent fasting for most people is calorie restriction. In other words, going to lose some weight. But the really exciting goal is that other goal, which is actually achieving extending fasting periods. And by doing that, you're actually getting the benefits of your body switching to high efficiency mode, improving its mitochondrial function, improving its energy, um, uh, improving its damage control, improving all of those things that go with being efficient and lean and mean. And one of the ways that it does this is by improving all sorts of things, not just the uh, uh, the diet and the activity and the sleep, but also by improving your circadian rhythm and your gut microbiome. And it's very clear that now the intermittent fasting effects on how your gut actually works are very significant. Your gut needs a rest once in a while. We're feeding it so often that it actually doesn't have much time to rest even at night. But actually the improvements in gut microbiome are very significant in terms of intermittent fasting and may play a real role in how you get improvements in, in longevity. There's also an effect on circadian clocks. And a very recent article just published online, and I sent it through to Kate a little bit earlier, and hopefully we can send that out to you guys a little bit later, is really exciting because what it did, it said, well, the major important time for eating is actually in the morning and up until lunchtime, and then everything on the afternoon, you don't need the extra energy because you're about to cool off and go to bed and do all those other things. So what would be really interesting is that if you squished your feeding into a period between you know, eight and uh, and two in the afternoon, and then you had that long rest of the time with fasting, what would happen compared to taking your meals normally across that same uh, period of time, eating exactly the same amount of calories? So it's not a weight loss problem. So what would happen if you improved your circadian rhythm by breakfast in the morning, physical activity through the day, and sleeping at night? In fact, they saw marked improvements in inflammation, in insulin metabolism, and other markers um, without seeing additional weight loss, suggesting that 
you need that rest period from your body, but also you need to work in with your own biological clock. And that's critically important. But the important thing really is, does intermittent fasting improve health more than conventional dieting, even when matched for weight loss? If you look at animals, the answer is absolutely positively yes. There's no question that from little Drosophila and nematodes all the way up to, to, to larger animals and even primates, it's very clear that um, long periods of fasting, so long as you're not nutritionally deficient, you're not taking too little fiber or too little vitamins or too little anything, actually leads to longer life. There's no question that the life is longer and that the health is longer as a result of these things. The jury is still out on humans. Humans are quirky creatures and they don't do always things exactly the same. But the reason that people are very excited about it and the slow aging movement is exciting about it because really it makes a lot of sense in convincing your body that um, if you like to be lean and mean and controlling its functions um, um, overall. So that's all I have to say about intermittent fasting. I think that it really is an exciting way to not only achieve weight loss, which has been essentially how most people have looked at it, but also to convince your body that fasting is actually a good thing for it um, because of the improvements in hormones, in metabolism, in, in energy utilization, but in particular in damage control that come with those things. I haven't touched, and I'll touch very briefly on the psychological things, because um, I know from personal experience and talk to many other people, the key issue about intermittent fasting is not only the one side, which is the hunger that you experience by fasting, but also the sense of self-control, self-awareness, particularly in terms of um, when you are fasting to actually know, well, actually, this is what hunger should feel like. Because it's often when you go through diets, you don't actually get hungry after you all those you all those package meals and, and and meal replacements. You don't actually know what hunger is. But to know what hunger is, to really feel yeah, this is what it means, and actually that feeling that I was feeling before was just stress. It wasn't really hunger. To be able to then say, oh look, I can control this. I can be in charge of this. I can get you know, if you like the self-awareness that comes from knowing what my hunger is, knowing what my body is, body is feeling like after food, it's actually a really positive and uplifting experience. And a lot of people really like intermittent fasting as a means to, to not only diet, but also improve their health simply because not only is it cheap, you have to eat less of the things that you're already doing, doesn't involve restrictions or change only on the days that you need to stop or reduce do you change things you don't have to change what you eat you have to check when you eat and then overall that allows you to get in touch with your the psychology of hunger how you're feeling and that actually can improve things the real tricks are in and around getting a diet getting intermittent fasting plan that works best with your kind of um, day, that works best with your kind of activity um, or, or requirements. Because of course, many people end up being very variable. Some days it's party day, some days it's quiet day. How do you work in with all of those things to make sure that you've got enough energy when you need it? How do you make sure you keep enough fiber to keep your bowels going and enough fluid to keep dehydration and, and also to give enough reward in your food? Food's one of the great rewards in life. There's no point just eating cardboard. You have to have some reward as well. So there's positives that you can get from food without the negatives and balancing those things is tricky. And that's why we're really interested over the next few weeks to hear your experiences. How do you make this a really positive experience? How do you deal with the negatives and the, um, how do you accent the positive and eliminate the negatives? How do you get help? What kind of help would you need? And where do you go from there? So I'm really interested to see how this process goes. And if there are questions now, hopefully I can um, uh, answer a few of them about the science. You guys know what it's, uh, the, the psychology much better the, the, than I do because you're experiencing it right at the moment. But the science, maybe I can tell you a bit of a story. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Merlin, it's fantastic. Um, hey, Tom, I'm going to unmute people and then um, everyone can have an opportunity to um, pop in with a question. Um, and if no one has a question straight up, I'm happy to tell my own story. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, Merlin's comments on uh, adapting the uh, what he, Merlin was saying, the 
keeping the eating window to be, be, between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. Mm. Um, but adapt that to your natural biorhythm because my, my sort of pattern is to want to eat between 11 and 4. Uh, I'm quite happy. I don't like eating before 11 and I prefer not to eat after six o'clock at the latest, mm -hmm. but I'm happy to make that four o'clock instead. But that's slightly staggering the window in, in the other direction. So, um, yeah, I'd be interested in Merlin's thoughts. I don't think that's a bad thing, um, but it's really interesting that, that in the one study that recently came out that looked at saying, well, how, how should we how should we squish up the, the the window to prolong the window of fasting? Could you should you eat in the morning? Should you eat in the uh, middle of the day? And should you actually do all of your eating in the evening? And in fact, in the one study that was done in people eating. Um, 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 all in the afternoon and evening, it turned out that there was nothing positive gained from that. Whereas actually the earlier time points um, more associated with the, the activities of the day were. So I think that you're right. Um, the best diet is the one that you can do and that's most suited to your level of activity. But the later and later that you push it, the more it, um, it doesn't seem to work as well. So there, there is certainly a real circadian rhythm that the morning and the eating with the physical activity and the starting of the day actually is quite a powerful part of that normal rhythm. And the, re the recent data, as I say, published in, in um, Cell Metabolism just a couple of uh, weeks ago, really would support the earlier window rather than the, um, you, know, you know how we used to do it where we used to have the big meal at the middle of the day. That's not a bad thing. But now there's too many, you know, we, we have a Chinese banquet that's like this big at eight o'clock at night. It's like, what do you expect? That's not really the good thing at all. I think the earlier we can get it and the smaller meals in the evening as appropriate, or if possible, not needing the meals in the evening and keeping the, 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 the calories down by limiting the number of meals. You don't have to limit the enjoyment. You can still have a wonderful lunch. That's fantastic. But then you just reduce the amount they have at other times. And I think that's a, a really good opportunity. And finding your own way is the most important solution. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. It's very exciting to uh, see the number of people who've hopped on tonight. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Merlin, my own story with this was that uh, I found it quite hard to go without food in the mornings at first and that's, or, or go without food full stop. And um, uh, what, what I decided to do was to just start jiggling the windows a little bit. So just bringing, bringing dinner back earlier, bringing breakfast back a bit later and just starting by inching it. And this enabled me to gain some control. But initially, the idea of not having dinner um, or not having breakfast um, was just so hard on my system, so ravenous, and actually didn't help me at all um, physically, uh, that I just went for this very gradual approach. And it's worked out to be um, helpful for me in, in actually being able to achieve it. So I, I wanted to make that point um, because I think, um, obviously, in my case, I'm in my early 60s, I've had a, a bit, of, um, bit of a hard time getting that glucose tolerance sorted. So I don't know whether you'd like to comment on that, but um, that's the way I've moved, my, moved myself around this. The, the interesting thing is that, that you say is that the the most important thing that you that you found is that by taking small steps you can you can that allows you to move towards bigger ones and I think that's really important for most people in their in their diets it doesn't need a massive change they don't need to change their uh, the, the the things that they eat massively they don't need to suddenly become eat a Japanese diet or, or suddenly become a different, they don't have to become a different person, but they do need to look at the major sources of calories in their life and find ways of reducing that without reducing their enjoyment of food. Because, you know, let's face it, we love food, but there are ways to access our, uh, the diet without um, needing to eat too much, but also to extend the periods that we are fasting. Now, I, from my personal experience, I, I have for, um, for decades, essentially eaten only once a day. 
Um, but that's just me. I'm, I'm very happy with that because I've, I've got into a pattern of making sure that I do that. Um, and I really enjoy food, you know, I just fantastic. But if I was to eat three meals a day with morning teas and afternoon teas, it wouldn't be a good thing. So there has to be, everyone finds their own way to, to, um, to deal with their, 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 their food intake and control it. And once you've got a control of it, actually there's so much power that comes with that. It's really exciting, and I and, and your story, Margo, is exactly that, that. That once you feel that you can move things, you get so much power to yourself, saying, "I've got control of my food intake. I've got control of what I do," and I think that's really helpful. In terms of the the major issue that you talked about, which is which is insulin and and, and diabetes, what we now know is that. Uh, in, in, for example, in Australia, there are, there are two and a half million people with diabetes. Now, these are people who have not just, you know, been, you know, eating vast amounts of food or terribly overweight or going to McDonald's. These are normal, everyday Australians who are facing this just because they ate a little bit more than they were able to burn up. And slowly, that fat, because of their size, because of their gender, because of their, their ethnicity, has just gone into the wrong places. But we absolutely know that if you take someone with insulin resistance and you lose some of that fat and you increase your physical activity, what's really exciting is not only can you reduce your risk of diabetes, and in one study it was 50% over three years, but the really exciting thing is that when you looked at those people who did this particular study in the, in the 1980s and said, well, I've got insulin resistance, I'll lose some weight, I'll do some more physical activity, they followed them for 30 years after that four-year trial. 30 years later, they were still less likely to be dead. So yeah. there's an enormous legacy that you're creating right now yeah. that actually doesn't go away when you stop the diet. Actually, it carries forward decades further by controlling your weight and controlling your, your health. Actually, it can carry forward. And these people from, from China, what they did in the 1980s is still influencing you, them now. So imagine yourself, what were you eating in the 1980s? What were you doing in the 1980s? What, 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 what bad things were you doing? In the 90s? It's carrying through now. And that's the exciting thing. But the other thing is that what you're doing now will influence you in 20, 30, and 20, 40. So if you're planning to be around, then the choices that you make now do carry forward, which is exciting. And in terms of insulin resistance, absolutely, if you control your waste, control your, your fat stores, increase your physical activity, you can push all of that away. You can undo the memories of the 1980s. And I think that's really a positive message. That's very encouraging. Yeah, yeah, mm. it is very encouraging. I think the thing for me was I found it um, very uncomfortable not having food in my system when I first started playing with this. And I felt weak and miserable. But now I don't actually have that. And that's the point I wanted to make. I've just done it by being very... Um, sly <clears throat> in terms of just slowly shifting the window. But also, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So the thing I found is that um, by shifting to a more of a low, lower carb, higher fat, good fat, I'm yep. not as hungry, anywhere near as hungry. And Merlin, mm. I don't know if this is the best thing to do, so I'm not advocating for it, but it works for me. I've been taking exogenous ketones in the morning before I work out. So what's your, what's your view on that? Because this is sort of all the rage with these low carb diets is to push yourself uh, towards ketosis. Um, and I, I certainly find it makes a huge difference. I actually kill my appetite, I have no appetite at all. And everyone knows me, knows what a pig I am. So it's incredible. Like I'm just going, hallelujah. I don't even think about my weight. You can laugh, but the truth is she loves food. Oh God, it's my only joy. So um, what do you think, Merlin? Is it, is it something that is, going to be okay if someone wanted to take exogenous ketones to sort of get through that initial phase? Well, you're, you're absolutely right that, that ketones play an important role in, in terms of your body and its energy metabolism. So for those of you not familiar with ketones, ketones are a substance made by the liver when the... Um, uh, your body is short of energy. So, for example, when you're fasting through the night and not eating at all, you make a small amount of ketones so that your body can eat them instead of eating sugar, which belongs to your brain. Because hierarchically, brain is number one. So 
brain only runs on sugar and so that if you have for example uh, reduced your your food intake or your fast for a whole day your body needs to generate some other source of energy so that it doesn't lose up all use up all the glucose and stop your brain functioning because if you're you know fasting and you can't find your next food source wouldn't it be a disaster if your brain didn't function so this is why you shift to sh shift to ketones and the longer you fast the more ketones that that you generate now some people have said, well, actually the presence of this alternative energy source is one of the triggers for efficiency. So that when your heart realizes that there's another cool energy source to use instead of sugar, it grabs that instead of sugar. So the sugar's available for your brain and the heart's running on ketones. And, other, and your muscles also run on ketones and other kinds of things run on ketones to keep the glucose available for your brain. And so one of the signals for your heart to be more efficient may actually be the ketones. And one of the signals for your brain to be actually feeling a bit more buzzed, like Kate, and all of those other psychological features. And in fact, for a long period, people were using a ketogenic diets to treat epilepsy because they have major effects on brain function. So there's no doubt that ketones absolutely have feedback effects um, into the way that your body functions. The other thing to say is that they are a marker if you generate ketones of your body being in the fasted state. So we don't know how much of the good deal with ketones is due to the ketones themselves or the fact that they are marking that you're, you're fasting. So you can probably replicate, Kate, some of the effects of, of a fast with a little bit of ketones, but yeah. probably not all of them. So no, you still right. need to do the fasting as well, but ketones might have some positive effects as well. Well, I found that I've, it's given me, I did push myself into ketosis more quickly, so it did work. I, I tested my urine. So I took the ketones. What I do is I take them before I work out, but I take essential amino acids. Mm -hmm. And then I'm eating a lot less. I'm able to just eat twice a day rather than constantly thinking about food. I was having a shake for breakfast and then a bigger lunch and then nothing and felt that and felt quite comfortable. So it's like a revelation for me for this to happen. So I mean, a, lot, a lot of people find different ways, different yeah. things that really influence how they feel in terms of when they feel full and in terms of their appetite. Yeah. Some people find that uh, the only way to feel full is actually, for example, to have um, a sense of full in their tummy. And so adding more fiber and soluble fiber into your yeah. diet actually is a good way to do that. Other people find that they need to feel uh, uh, full by the for example, the reward they get from their food. And I find that the best way for me to limit, for example, my love of beer is to buy really expensive beer. And I get, <laughs> I get the rewarding experience from it and I don't drink too much of it because it's too damn expensive. You know? <laughs> so it's, sim it's simplifying that, that what we need in terms of the cues that say, that's enough. Yeah and, yeah, and for you, actually, it seems to be your ketones involved in, in saying, well, actually, I should be in a, when I get the ketone signal, I'm in that fasting state. So I better stay there. Um, yeah, and I also so, add a lot of fiber now to my morning drink. So I think that's helping as well with, because um, I have a shake now for breakfast rather than breakfast sometimes. I mean, you're, you're mentioning mm -hmm. inulin and soluble fiber. Yeah, yeah inulin really and cilium important. and... Put it, I put everything in there. A yeah, yeah. really important way to, to deal with intermittent fasting is to have that fiber in your diet yeah. because one of the problems with intermittent fasting is, is actually constipation. It's that yeah. if you're not eating enough, there's not enough to propel things through, but with a little bit of extra gas with the fiber and a little bit of extra bulk. Talk a little fiber. bit about inulin while you're there because that's really interesting um, and it's cheap. It's a very cheap, yeah, you have to sort of not do a big dose straight up. I notice you have to sort of titrate it a little bit at the start. Otherwise, you get a lot of wind. Space but, uh, out a bit. Just start building up is what you yeah, mean. Absolutely. You can't yeah. start eating by two, two, two cans of baked beans a day. That's not going to work, right? Yeah, right. So, so you just a little bit at a time but to allow you your flora to adjust. It's just really easy to drink, isn't it? It's apparently got massive benefits. Well, one, of the, one of the interesting things is that, that there, there are two essentially kinds of fiber. The one fiber is, if you like, the insoluble fiber that they use to make cardboard, right? Tastes like cardboard is cardboard, but your gut bacteria sort of 
goes through, holds water, gives bulk to your stool, but doesn't give much feed to them. The other kind of fiber is like the soluble fiber, which your inulin is a, is a kind that you can get, but you can also get them from plenty of fruit and vegetables give you these kinds of things. The problem is that if you take too many of those things, they are fermented by the gut bacteria who think, wow, it's party time and you get tummy aches and bloating and distension and that's not very nice and that's why a lot of people are saying well you should be going low FODMAP low fermentable fiber that's the problem because actually the fermentable fiber is the stuff that's keeping you healthy so what you have to do is find a way around that by really slowly increasing the amount of fiber not to the point that you blow up and go oh, I'm terrible I don't like this anymore but really take it gently and carefully and build the amount up until it becomes a natural part of your, your your diet. Every time you take mince, you mix in with lentils. Every time you take a chicken mix, you mix in those chickpeas. Find ways to introduce fiber, not all at once, but just little bits at a time. And that'll improve not only your gut health, um, but also your, um, your, your overall health as well. Mm, fantastic. Mm, very interesting. Have we got more questions here from people who are participating tonight? I, I could go on asking questions forever. I'm absolutely <laughs> fascinated and, and Merlin talks. I'm really enjoying listening to Merlin. So thank you. Uh, two, two questions. One is um, I'd, I'd love to know why salads give me indigestion, but I can ge eat, eat the same vegetables in massive quantities if they're cooked. And, and the other question is, I'm fascinated about the area of research around uh, fermented foods and improving the gut biome generally. And, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear your comments on, on, on that area. Isn't, isn't it interesting that, that, that you say that, um, that certain salads um, give you indigestion and, and, and others not? What, what's fascinating is that we realize that there's a lot more going on in vegetables than we ever thought. We all just thought vegetables were just you know, fiber and a few phytonutrients. But actually, there's a lot of stuff going on. And one of the things is that some people, because of the way their microbiome works, when you give them fresh vegetables, um, and in particular, anything with, on with onions in them, um, or uh, um, and for some people it's even lettuce. It's really quite interesting that fresh lettuce is enough for their microbiome to go, wow, this is a great feed, will make um, um, gas, it'll make us feel distended and actually might lead us to um, um, indigestion. Whereas for other people, not that at all. But when you cook it, the interesting thing is when you cook the... Um, um, uh, the, the vegetables, a lot of that fiber is softened and so it becomes now available to your... Um, if you like, your digestion and your food. And so you don't experience the same kind of um, uh, bloating and, and feeling. So you're, you're absolutely right. That's a, a, co a common thing. Mm -hmm. The other question that you had um, is in terms of fermented foods. And in fact, if you like, all food is fermented eventually in our gut in some kind of way. Anything that isn't absorbed in our intestine becomes either fermented by our, our bacteria or used in, in some other way. And a lot of people think that maybe if we could do that outside the body instead of inside the body we would be able to get some of the benefits from that and a classic example is the story regarding fermented milk so a lot of the fermented milk that, that, that that's that's out there if you look at the yogurts and the cheeses and other kinds of things when you look at this association with heart disease and cancer and mortality it's actually really good for for reducing those things whereas normal milk is equivocal um and actually um dairy products that are cooked or, or baked or whatever, actually is, it's no good at all. And what we're starting to realize is that you can mimic some of the effects of what's going on inside your gut actually in a vat. And by taking those uh, 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 milk products, for example, that are fermented, actually there's some improvements in health. The other thing is that the fermentation process destroys a lot of the, um, the things that we don't like, like lactose, which can give a lot of people um, indigestion. Um, but it still has a lot of the nutrients still left in it to provide um, uh, health for the gut bacteria and, and the like. So um, I, I could, I guess, uh, I could talk all day about fermented foods, but maybe we'll do that another time. Yeah, um, we should do uh, something uh, of it. Yeah, that'd be good. Mm. Thank question. you. Yeah. And, and yes, lettuce, lettuce is a classic for giving me indigestion and um, onions as well. Mm. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's nice <laughs> to know. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So are there any other questions? 
Otherwise, we'll let Merlin get back to his um, kids and wife. Yeah. Um, Good. I, I think it's been fantastic. And um, I'd really like to say thank you to all the people who have found the time to participate. It's, it's wonderful. And we, will, we have recorded this. So it will be available for looking at again. So, Kate, I'm not sure if you want to add anything. Lovely to have you. No, along. no, it's just Merlin. thanks, Merlin, so much. You're a honey for helping yeah. out. And yeah, but if, you, if, if anyone's got any questions, and I'll, I'll keep on sending some, some new material through to you yeah, guys I'll, that you can I'll read that, and um, see how that goes. Article. You emailed it to me earlier, did you? Because I'll have to have a check to see, and I'll upload it as well. Sure. But, yeah, we'll do that. All right. And then and maybe it, we can do something on um, gut later on in the two yeah. weeks. And th th that would be lovely. And anything you don't know, it's always in my book. Always read my book. There you go. <laughs> okay. We All right. The longevity list. There you go. Okay. Well, we should actually send me some stuff. We should excerpt from it, Merlin, maybe. That'd be cool. Yeah. All right. Um, what's the title of the book again? The long it's longevity list. The longevity list. Things that you do to, um, to improve your health, starting from cutting down on chocolate and working your way up. <laughs> Dang that chocolate, Merlin. Get off now. <laughs> we can't get up chocolate. God. Yes. Yes. I, right. I'm, I bust these myths, you know. I say that chocolate's okay, that alcohol's okay, Yay. everything else is okay. Only the good <laughs> stuff is the good part. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not too much, just the good yeah. stuff. Good dark chocolate is. Thanks, Merlin. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank, you All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, Thank you. we'll upload the recording and I'll get that paper and upload that now, actually. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.